Oh, hello, everybody. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm just trying not to remember that today is trick or treat day. So what's the trick and what's the, 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 uh, the, 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 the treat? But I have to remind myself of something that I was hearing about at the beginning of this week that may seem a million miles from here. And in one sense is I was listening to a presentation, an excellent presentation by a soldier from the Rifles, one of our infantry units. And he was talking about um, his experience and the experience of Afghanistan. And people will know that in the last few days, we have taken the flag down in Afghanistan, and our troops are going to be returning. And he was talking about where the British have been, Helmand province. Uh, and he was talking also about Fort Bastion, where we have been based. And he told us that Fort Bastion was the size of Coventry, which gave me an incredible shock. We are talking about huge. We are talking about multi-billions. We are talking about 453 British men and women killed over those 13 years. Uh, and we are talking also about many more Afghanistani people dying. And we are talking about us now leaving and nothing, as far as many feel, being achieved. Because what he's, his response to the question, what do you think is going to happen next, was I think, in all likelihood, the Taliban are going to return. And we must compare that with the sum that we've just heard for people that we know are a very much rising population of social care service users, people who are older and disabled people of, of working age and younger people, of a, an allowance of 14.5 million for the start-up year. Anyway, I do need to stress, having made that complex introduction. I'm really pleased to be here. It's fabulous to see so many people committed to advocacy. And as you've heard, just to know where I'm coming from, we need always to be clear about where we're coming from. I've got a background of interest in issues of participation and involvement as a researcher, as an activist, as a writer, as a service user, and as an educator. And I'm co-chair of a national independent user-led uh, organization, Shaping Our Lives, we include the diversity of people who are adults who use social care. And as I've said in my title, I, I think that advocacy is possibly the best thing in the world. And I speak from experience. But I think it faces particular threats in these complex and difficult days. And I want to touch on these from a service user perspective. Because when I was coming to, to do today, I realized that I've spent really an adult lifetime talking and thinking and trying to do about advocacy. And it's raised many issues for me. I've been concerned ab ab about why it is important. Some people think that if things go wrong, they'll be able to sort them out for themselves. And it's said that a lot now that when people will get older, they say it won't be like past generations of older people, when people were perhaps accepting, had low expectations, and could get pushed around by services and systems. This will be a consumer and choice generation. They won't stand for it. They are the assertive baby boomers. And I say, kid the Marines. I have a saying for myself to cope. I can advocate for you. You can advocate for me. But it's a very different kettle of fish when you have to advocate for yourself in difficult and disempowering circumstances. And of course, when do we need an advocate when circumstances are difficult and disempowering? And currently, as I've already suggested, we live in a difficult and disempowering world. When the shit hits the fan, it isn't so easy for me, and I speak from experience, for me to advocate for me. And I'm suggesting perhaps also for you to advocate for you. It just doesn't work like that. And I really want to emphasize that this comes from my own experience and of many other people as service users I've encountered and we've had those conversations. I don't know if you'll agree, but that's how I found it to be. So the first thing I've learned is that advocacy is for all of us. It isn't just for other people. And we've been hearing in the honest account that Carl gave that this is not a universalist offer. Well, I would suggest that what we need is a universalist offer. We all need a little help from our friends. Now, over the years, I've also learned 
uh, to talk about and understand there are different forms that advocacy can take. And Carl was very, was very modest in his uh, description of himself as, 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 as uh, more to learn. We can be talking about professional advocacy, legal advocacy, citizen advocacy, self-advocacy, peer advocacy, collective advocacy, uh, and s collective self-advocacy, and so on. And all are different, all have a part to play, all can help us develop our capacity to speak for ourselves. Self-advocacy, speak for ourselves, which for me is the gold standard of being a citizen in a society. It's the ultimate in empowerment. We don't need someone else, we can do it. And it may be in different forms, we not, may not be talking about verbal communication, but we can speak for ourselves. But I wouldn't want to argue that self-advocacy was the only way forward. Then I've learned uh, and talked about the key components that there seem to be that people always mention of good advocacy. And these include that it's independent, that it's provided by skilled, experienced, and perhaps qualified advocates, that it's ongoing and isn't just restricted to emergencies and crises and when things have already gone seriously wrong, like with complaints. And I thought again it was good to hear that we're not just talking about advocacy for complaints. And critically for me that it's relational, that it builds on the advocate and the person that they are advocating with and for getting to know each other and building trust and familiarity, having a relationship, that it's universally available that it recognises and addresses diversity, values it, recognises it, treats people with equality, regardless of difference and so on. So as this suggests, we've all of us come to know a lot about advocacy, and I really would not be surprised, in fact I'm quite confident, that the people gathered today in this room could construct the most helpful, feasible, useful policy and practice for advocacy, for all forms of advocacy, given the pen and paper now. I'm afraid, though, that my suspicion is that if we put forward that offer, uh, then we might well get from the policymakers quite a stony silence from those powers that be. The sad thing is that the lesson of my experience, and I've always worked with other people collectively, so I hope it's not just me uh, getting a rather un un a biased and unhelpful view, is the unprogressive nature of policy debate and development in relation to advocacy. Oh yes, of course, over the years, pioneers and advocates like the people here, service users and their families, have learned many new things, developed practice, raised the flag, and the discussion, kept that discussion going, developed its sophistication brilliantly. But here in this country, successive governments, this is not about one particular government, have consistently, in my view, shown little true interest in advocacy. They do talk the talk, they know which buttons to press with the rhetoric, but walking the walk, now that has consistently, consistently, and I would suggest over a long period of time, been a very different story. The government, and I'd say also its predecessors of all political colours, have never been centrally interested in advocacy, whatever kind we are talking about. They are happy to talk about the giving of information, advice, and guidance, and you may remember that Carl referred to that and said that that might actually serve as advocacy. That's always had a kind of feel-good sound, I think, to policymakers. It kind of feels cheaper than actually providing services. But advocacy, advocacy itself, tends not to make that list. After all, and it doesn't take a genius to work this one out, if you support people to work out what they want, they might want more services rather than less. So advocacy doesn't tend to make the governmental list. And when it does, and I think we've heard it today, there's very rarely a, very rarely a serious commitment to it, backed up by requirements. It has to be, not you might feel like doing it, and of course funding resources. So let me take a look, um, trick and treat, let me take a look at the New Care Act as it seems from a service user's perspective. Now anyone uh, who's had more than a passing acquaintance with this new piece of legislation uh, and its guidance knows that it's very skillfully uh, constructed overall. There is all the rhetoric here of empowerment, involvement, co-production. Let's all love and be nice to each other in our cosy-wosy world. Uh, 
uh, which we've come to expect from modern policymakers and their documentation. But, and I'm going to reiterate, perhaps at much less length, what Carl's already told us, what does it actually have to say about advocacy? Section 67 of the Act places a duty on councils to use an independent advocate if the person would experience substantial difficulty in doing one or more of the following. A, understanding relevant information. B, retaining that information. C, using or weighing that information as part of the process of being involved. D, communicating the individual's views, wishes or feelings. And there is no one, the other caveat, in the person's network able to fulfill the function. Just imagine any reason why you may have come the way of the social care system and just imagine how well any of those factors might apply to you. This is an appallingly shamefully narrow view of advocacy and does not include the role of advocate to represent people simply to ensure that their rights are protected. But equally, of course, there's nothing in the law to stop someone using an advocate in this way, just that the council's, council is not obliged to arrange it and, of course, is unlikely to have the funding to provide it. So it doesn't actually prohibit the use of an advocate in the widest sense, but it places no duties on councils to promote it. I said before I heard the figures, the detailed figures that Carl's offered us, that government is unlikely, I thought, to provide the funding to make this real. And I think we've got an idea from the sort of numbers, the maths that we're getting, that that's going to be the case. Anybody who's got any familiarity with working in organisations knows what a few million quid actually boils down to. If you are trying to promote a national policy, even if only for England, for a group of people, social care service users, which runs into the millions in time to come. We can all work out reasonably speedily what all this is likely to mean in the real world in relation to the rights that the Act says it's concerned to promote very little. Now all this would be bad enough in my opinion. We're certainly no better off now than we were years ago. But next to this you have to add, I would suggest, three key related developments. First, the massive spending cuts which mean that people's access to help and support from mainstream services and specialist support services like social care has been increasingly restricted. It's much more difficult Statistics tell us the enormous numbers, for example, of older people. It's much more difficult to get the help you need or that you may even formally have received. The lack of help and support means that problems get bigger, get worse. They magnify people's difficulties. These overall cuts have, of course, had major effects on traditional advocacy services and the third sector organisations, which have often majored in providing them as their funding and grants have been reduced and cut. Second, the user-led organisations, the disabled people's organisations that emerged in the latter part of the 20th century and have always been especially valued by service users as a really helpful source of advocacy and support, have suffered disproportionately with the restructuring of social policy under this government and its cuts in public spending. As we've seen in Shaping Our Lives, where we have a network of user-led organisations, as a new user-led organisation manages to emerge and after much effort gets set up, we can expect, we're actually seeing it, uh, a longer-standing organisation to fail because of long-standing big problems of insecure and inadequate funding. If the big voluntary organisations, the, the traditional charities, whose role as advocates has been increasingly compromised by their role as contract seekers and service providers, seem to grow in wealth, visibility, prominence. The opposite is true of the black minority ethnic, small third sector and user-led organisations that have been conspicuously helpful over the years, providers of all forms and initiators of all forms of advocacy. Any idea that volunteers can compensate for this may make sense in the ruminations of policy wonks who advise governments and ministers and pen empty slogans like big society, but they do not, we know, they do not mean very much on the ground. They do not meet needs reliably 
adequately or consistently. And they increasingly won't, not because we don't care for each other, but as more and more people have to work longer and longer hours to make some kind of living in our in increasingly insecure and anti-personal labour market. Which brings me to the third point that has to be raised in relation to advocacy what the government calls euphemistically welfare reform. We know what this term is code for. It's code now for overall caps, unprecedented even under the Victorian poor law on welfare benefit spending, regardless of economic, social, or personal change realities. It's code for caps on individuals' benefit levels, whatever their needs. It's code for making people move out of their homes, their neighborhoods, even we're certainly seeing in London their town or city because of caps on housing benefit, the imposition of the bedroom tax, and so on. So it means exacerbating many people's problems by removing them from what's familiar, their networks, their circles of informal support, even sometimes, of course, key health and support relationships that may have developed over the years. But less often talked about is the increasing inefficiency and failure of the benefit system as it is denuded of money, increasingly dependent on unreliable IT systems and claimants increasingly, it would appear, devalued. I want to turn here, if I could, just to the experience of my partner, Susie, because I hear close up from her uh, and her colleagues regularly uh, what the consistent realities are uh, for people in this situation in a city like London. Where people are placed on new benefits now, say disability benefits, the time it takes for reviews to be undertaken to ensure that they receive their full entitlement now runs into months, not weeks, sometimes even a year and more which time you're getting the lowest level if you're getting at all. We know that the processes for assessment are harsh, defective and often arbitrary. We know that when people are represented where there is advocacy, where decisions are reviewed, then the level of reversals so that people are secured their entitlements and benefits are incredibly high. This means that more and more to negotiate this system, people need help people need advocacy, most will not get it. Most will be on their own, perhaps with the support of a well-meaning but not experienced friend or neighbour, at the mercy of a system I can only describe as vicious, cruel and antipersonal. Now what I ought to say here is that my, my partner works as a senior social worker with people who are dying and who are facing bereavement in a hospice. These are the government scroungers we have to believe, not strivers in that particular case. She's proud that so far all the reviews that she and the people she's worked with uh, have taken part in, they haven't lost one. Not a single case, but at what personal and social cost for those people? I've come to the conclusion, I have to be honest with you, from listening to these daily accounts of the present realities of the benefits and housing systems, and I haven't mentioned, I need to be honest, the frequent reports of the harsh and arbitrary behaviour of our large housing associations to their tenants, that there is now, in our government's understanding, no such thing as a deserving poor person, no such thing as a deserving uh, claimant, not for our ministers and not for our government. Now Susie, my partner, is I think a highly skilled and experienced advocate. She has access to the Child Poverty Action Group's professional helpline because the system's constantly changing for the most reliable and up-to-date information and advice. She doesn't have to pay, of course, for the phone when she talks and gets through to the benefits agency, or tries to, or tries to follow them up with lost papers, delays, inefficiencies, incompetence, and difficulties. I would personally say everyone should have an advocate like Susie, but I don't think that the CARE Act's going to offer it. The truth is, as the need for advocacy increases, so its availability certainly doesn't. Instead, the opposite seems to be the truth. Now remember what I've said. I believe that advocacy in all its expressions can be the best thing in the world because it's key to empowerment. It enables us to be and act as we could be in our lives. It should be there for all of us. Any of us might need it, I've learned that, not just associated with some narrow, quotes, targeted or perceived 
usual suspects. We will all benefit from it, we do. We will all need it at particular times in our life. But I want to make one point here. Advocacy should, must never be an alternative to supportive, approachable, accessible, diversity-valuing services, agencies and support. It should not be there as I fear increasingly it has to be, but isn't, to avoid people being routinely excluded or facing harsh and unnecessary barriers in the system. And that's the terrible irony of where we are here today, that policymakers have made services and policies more and more impenetrable for ordinary people who cannot buy themselves out of life's difficulties. They've cut services, they've made them more judgmental and competitive, they've increased the demand for advocacy for all the wrong reasons, and of course they have reduced rather than increased the availability of that advocacy. My partner has said to me, and I've heard it from others, that her job is now increasingly one of supporting people deal with their benefits problems, rather than attending to, we don't need to think about it, the massive range of problems that you are, can expect to face if you are facing a life-limiting condition or bereavement. The costs of this government's policies, of course, are being passed on to people like Susie, to workers like her, to voluntary organisations like hers, the communities that try and raise funds for those organisations, and of course, most of all, to the service users and claimants and their families who suffer firsthand the destructive effects of the ideological whimsies of people like Ian Duncan Smith and Lord Freud. So this is the challenge for me that faces advocacy and advocates seeking to support advocacy. This is the reason we will all need sources of support to maintain that struggle. This is why that struggle is so important. It's so great to see so many people here. We all have to be advocates for advocacy. We must all support each other to keep going as advocates for it. I hope we're all in it to win it. Thank you. <laughs>